That's right. Disdain is my default greeting. Shining a light on autism and life as an autistic person. Welcome to My Friend Autism, a podcast breaking down barriers, stigma and misconceptions around autism while increasing understanding and acceptance of the autistic community. And now, here's your neurodivergent host, Orion Kelly. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for listening to My Friend Autism, my podcast. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. I'm all about helping you raise your level of understanding, acceptance, and appreciation of the autistic community. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check out the podcast and check out the YouTube channels. Orion Kelly, that autistic guy, and my video podcast YouTube channel, Orion Kelly Podcasts. You might be watching this podcast as a video podcast right now on my YouTube channel, or you might be listening to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, which is great. Either way. No judgment here, my friends. Okay, I take that back. There'll be nothing but judgment in this podcast. I apologize for that misleading statement at the start there. (laughs) Uh, Let's just get right to it. All right, on this video podcast, I want to talk about a topic that probably is one of the most controversial topics I've ever tried to discuss with uh, my amazing YouTube community, Cassandra Syndrome. Hmm. How can Cassandra Syndrome ruin relationships? Now, I'm, when I talk, I'm probably more mean neurodivergent people in relationships. Or let, let's more specifically say, how can Cassandra syndrome ruin neurodiverse relationships? So neurotypical and neurodivergent people in a relationship, like my wife and I, for example. Plus, I want to provide some strategies, some step-by-step strategies that you can use to help improve communication and understanding in your neurodiverse relationship. Because... A lot of people that watch the videos are in neurodiverse relationships. They may have thought that you and your partner were both neurotypical and then you might have had a kid or had a realisation that, in fact, you are autistic or neurodivergent. You're trying to navigate that. Well, I'm here to help (laughs) in no way possible. So we better start at the start. What is Cassandra syndrome? So Cassandra syndrome, and th- th- just be clear, this is in general conversational terms. This is not a lecture at a university. I'm not an academic. I'm not a doctor, healthcare professional, a psychologist. Oh, they're all the same stuff, right? I'm just a dude sharing my own lived experiences, having a general discussion. So let's just put that there. Yeah, sure, there'll still be a thousand comments before this is even out. <laughs> we'll get to that in a sec. So Cassandra syndrome is an experience that occurs when a person's feelings and needs are dismissed or ignored by others, despite being communicated clearly. I'm going to get down into this a bit deeper in a sec. This may be because the person who communicated it clearly their needs, their feelings. In fact, it didn't to the other person. They feel they have communicated it clearly. The breakdown could be in how they communicated or in neurodiverse relationships, the breakdown could be in how that information is being received because it is being communicated differently. So it's not that it's not being communicated clearly by the person communicating it. It could be received wrong. This is where it gets really murky and tricky, but fascinating. The Cassandra syndrome can have a negative impact on relationships. Right. Why? Well, because there's, there's feelings of disconnect, feelings of lack of trust, lack of respect. These things start to pop up. And obviously it can occur in many different ways, right? Many different situations. It's particularly relevant though, in the context of autistic people. So this is something, this is one of the, I want to, let's talk about the history first, but then I want to come back to this, right? I say, I say Cassandra syndrome is particularly relevant in the context of neurodiverse relationships. And this is where, I want to come back to this, because this is where it gets controversial. I'm talking about this 
through the lens of autistic people, where a lot of people chose to point out to me in any kind of conversation I've had about this in the past that I'm simply wrong. How am I wrong? Okay, we'll talk about that in a sec. So let's get all like historical one time. The term Cassandra syndrome comes from Greek mythology. So again, this is not a lecture in uni. There's no textbooks involved, just a general conversation. From my point of view, from my understanding, Cassandra was cursed to speak the truth but not be believed. Cursed to speak the truth but never be believed. Bloody hell, that sounds familiar. I'm not saying I'm cursed being autistic, but I'm saying the idea that my brain is different to the point where I do speak the truth and either people don't believe it or don't hear it or don't want to hear it or don't like it, something I can really relate to. <laughs> Let's continue. So the metaphor of this Greek mythology is often used to describe the experience autistic people may have in their difficulty expressing to other people their feelings, their thoughts, simply being understood. Right. Back to where people say I'm wrong. Okay, so this is how it plays out. This is how it sounds in my head, by the way, these comments. Like, like, totes Google searched this, like, totally, and every, like, total Google search result I get is, like, totally. Uh, Cassandra syndrome is about neurotypical partners being misunderstood, being not have st- things, like, totally from their autistic partner. You're making it out like it's how it affects autistic people, but, like, actually, it's, like, totally, like, totes Google search, totes, is how it affects Neurotypical people. That's how I hear it in my head. It's probably different to that. Probably more moronic. Um, okay, so let's, here we go. Now, okay, so welcome to my friend autism. I'm Orion. I'm an autistic guy. I make content about autism to help my autistic son have a better life and therefore help other people, right, other autistic people. So, yes, my content is through the lens of autistic people. Oh, Really? So if you're interested in that, then keep listening. If you think that I'm mis, I don't know, misconstruing or like, you know, ruining the premise of Cassandra syndrome and you don't like that, keep listening. (laughs) Either way, I think this is a great thing about the people that like to watch and listen to my content. The people that really like it and love it, they watch it, they listen to it. The people that just have some sort of bizarre, like, mean-spirited chip on their shoulder and just want to make bad, mean-spirited comments, hateful stuff, they listen and watch even longer. (laughs) So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) All right. So there's there's an argument here that I am completely misconstruing this entire podcast. That Cassandra syndrome is how autistic people make neurotypical people feel. So the neurotypical people are the ones experiencing the Cassandra syndrome, right? Because for some reason, their needs and their feelings are dismissed or ignored in in their minds by autistic people, even though they communicate it clearly. Now, You don't need to go to law school to get your head around the arguments here and the holes in the arguments. For starters, you know, through the the medical model, right, of looking at disabilities, if you do not have a diagnosed disability, then you are a strong, fit, healthy, normal human being, right? If you do, you're weak, broken, disabled, not normal human being. And that isn't our problem. You know, we can diagnose it, but it's your fault. And it's up to you. Don't look at us. Like, we're normal. You've got disability, great, enjoy. But stay away from us. Don't make our life any harder, right? That's the medical model. And the social model is that all human beings are human beings. We're all born 
We all die. Okay? We're all different. Everyone's different. Of course, there are different differences. <laughs> right? There are medically diagnosed thresholds of what can make people different to the extent that other people are not. So there's diversity in, in uh, let's go through them all, race, culture, um, intelligence. Like there's diverse, you know, gender, socioeconomic background, education. That's just diversity. But being diagnosed with a form of disability, a condition, is, at, is past a threshold of difference. So the social model would say that it's not my fault. Right? I've been diagnosed as autistic. It's not my fault that I'm autistic, right? It doesn't mean I'm broken, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not as valuable as any other human being. The medical model says I'm, I am actually not as valuable, right? I am actually broken and I am actually not as good as other human beings. The social model says it's not – actually, that's not true. I'm as valuable as any other human being because we're all human beings, right? And the, and, and the thing that's disabling me isn't, in fact, my disability, my condition. The thing that's disabling me is the rest of humanity. So the rest of humanity looking at it through a medical model and therefore disabling me by – not having any real want, wish, need to do anything to in any way include me. A classic example is legislation worldwide. Legislation worldwide enshrined across the planet to make sure when, when stuff gets built that there's ramps, right? When certain things get built... There's inclusive entrances and exits and things for people that use wheelchairs, for people with different levels of mobility. That's enshrined in law for the most part, right? Okay, so in other words, humanity were, were told, were made, were it had to be enshrined in law to, to include people who are different. So that is an example, prior to that, is an example of how well, in fact, it's, it's humanity in general who are disabling the people who use wheelchairs or have mobility challenges, right? Do you see what I'm saying? That's, that's the if, – if, I, mean, I can just be, be like you if I can get around, but all these bloody stairs, I'm stuffed, right? And the medical model says, okay, mate, well, climb them. Get out of the chair and crawl up the stairs. What, what do you want me to do? Carry you, right? So this is the thing. Autistic people, you've got these neurotypical people like totes – Likes totes, honestly, literally, literally on Google, saying, "Whatever, man. I'm the I'm a neurotypical person. I have no diagnosable condition or disability. And what you know, like you're saying, you're saying this is about you. You're saying that because I refuse to accept or understand that you, as an autistic person or neurodivergent person, communicate differently. Therefore, communicate your feelings and needs to me differently." And that I don't want to or, 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 or care to try and understand how you communicate differently and therefore be able to understand and receive your thoughts and feelings and needs. Because I what? I don't want to do that. That's my fault. What? So you're saying you're Cassandra now and I'm not? Like, you know, seriously, wow, that's not fair. You see how ridiculous this argument is? It's just, I'm sorry, guys. You know, some people like to say like autism is like a superpower and it's like some sort of blessing. What a load of crap. Like, every, you know, we are who we are, man. We're born who we are. I didn't choose to be born this way, right? We're born how we're born. It's a, you know, we can, we, you can be all positive and I'm, I, I love that. But, but let's be factual, though. It's a medically diagnosed disability, condition. If it wasn't diagnosed, you didn't get the threshold. But if you did, then your life is going to be harder. Or you wouldn't have got a diagnosis because you have challenges in things that other people find easy. So if you're one of those people that don't have a disability, that find communicating your feelings and needs easy, or hearing other people, you find that easy, how do you think that having that kind of free pass through life, living on a planet where you actually get the customs and language, how do you think that makes you the person 
who should be the Cassandra syndrome sufferer. That doesn't make any sense. The autistic people are dropped on a planet where they don't get the language, the customs, the rules, right, the conventions, unwritten rules, unspoken rules. So we're doing our best to try and communicate our stuff, but they're being dismissed. They're being ignored by others. So this is why I'm doing it through this lens. Again, totes can't wait for the comments. You guys are amazing. Like you guys know so much about so many things, uh, like totes. Whatever, man. Bring it on. <laughs> That's seriously. Anyway, man, this rant was brought to you by no one. <sighs> I'm getting so ranty, my headphones aren't even on my head properly. All right, I'm just going to get down to it. And I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to, to wait for, I can't wait for the conversations and comments from the neurotypical partners that think they're so hard done by because life's easy for them compared to someone who, uh, you know, challenges, uh, has challenges in every aspect of communication and interaction. <sighs> How does Cassandra syndrome occur? Autistic people, as you may know, as we've just spoken about, can have difficulties with social Cues, communication, interactions. Why? Part of our autistic brain. What will that do? Oh, I know what it'll do. It'll make it harder to express our feelings and our needs. As a result, partners or friends may dismiss or ignore our feelings and needs, leading to frustration and isolation for the autistic person. So, back over it. You're autistic. Diagnosable level of challenges in communication and interaction. Body language. All the cues, verbal cues, nonverbal cues, you know. Um, processing someone else's emotions or feelings. Processing your own emotions and feelings. And then being able to spit them out in a way where, keep in mind, it's like speaking another language. Spit them out in a way where you can understand them. And you don't. So you dismiss them or ignore them and then that leads to frustration and isolation for both, for both. That's fair. But still it's the autistic person who was trying to convey feelings and needs, right? You might feel isolated because you didn't understand what was happening, but you weren't trying to convey anything. We were. Now that this is, this, you, you want to convey stuff too, I get that. But most autistic people are, are probably, you know, are probably going to have their own tools and tricks they've learnt to make your life easier with follow-up questions and clarifying to get to the bottom of what the hell is you trying to say. Because we've, we've actually had to learn from the start the tools and tricks it, it takes to give any kind of acceptance or integration in, in a world that's not made for us, right? We actually had to do that and we do that. There's no level playing field here though in that. How does this happen? Well, if autistic people have difficulty expressing our feelings and needs in a way that's easily understood by our partners and friends, <laughs> how is it ever going to get to the point where we don't actually have a scenario where we feel like there's a disconnect, there's a lack of understanding, a disregard, a dismissal of what we're trying to convey? You get that, right? I I'm... I don't know how many more times I can say it differently. Another cause can be when the partner or friend isn't familiar with our unique challenges. So autistic people obviously aren't the same. Every autistic brain is different, just like every neurotypical brain or every other brain that is neither neurotypical nor autistic. Every brain is different. But you know what? If you have a... If you have a partner who's neurodivergent or a friend who's neurodivergent, are you seriously telling me you haven't actually taken the time to get to know the unique challenges your partner or your friend has in social interaction and communication as a result of their medically diagnosed condition, disability, whatever makes you feel good or sleep at night? I mean, you really haven't. If you haven't, then you've... You've absolutely done nothing but show to the world that you are nowhere near in the realm of calling yourself the Cassandra in this situation. Why? 
Well, we're going to face challenges in relationships because of our unique communication and interaction challenges, right? Okay. So that means we're not going to always understand how to communicate and respond appropriately. But, of course, if you already understand that, if you already appreciate that difference, then there's going to be an effort made on both parts and the Cassandra syndrome thing will be an irrelevance. It won't exist. Cassandra syndrome can have a negative impact on the relationship. Why? Because there's no winners in this. There's no winners. You're communicating your feelings and needs. You feel like you're doing it in an open, clear fashion. But it's being dismissed or ignored by the person you're trying to convey it to. So now there's no winners here. Someone thinks that their partner doesn't actually care about their feelings and needs and the partner doesn't even know what the feelings and needs are that you're trying to convey or hears it but doesn't understand the context of it and therefore says rubbish, rubbish, not right, dismisses it, ignores it, rejects it. The frustration, the isolation, and even worse, comes into play. Intimacy and emotional expression can be challenging for anyone, right? I get it. If you're in a relationship with someone, you don't need to be neurodivergent to have difficulties with intimacy, with being open, with showing your emotions. I get it. But again, when you pass a certain threshold of that difficulty and you receive a medical diagnosis that shows you the height of difficulty experienced by autistic or neurodivergent people in this, in this space of being intimate, being open emotionally. So we get that it's hard for everyone, probably for you as a neurotypical partner maybe, but it's, a, it's in acknowledging that the, the, the difficulties or the challenges for the autistic person are going to be at a level, a significant level that you don't want it. By the way, you don't want that level, right? This isn't a who's got the birth, the best level, but it's at a level that you can't relate to or you'd have a diagnosis as well. But just understanding that can be such a game changer. So you still might, I don't know if that helps you, but, but you still might be going, but why? Okay, so we know that autism is a neurodevelopmental condition it affects communication social interaction can have an impact on our general ability to understand to express to process emotions thoughts feelings needs i mean is, do, we, do we is there a need to go on from that point <clears throat> again this is the part where i when i when i, when I talk about this kind of stuff I really struggled to get my head around the idea that just because it's on the internet, just because the internet says, no, no, Cassandra syndrome can only be for people who are in relationships with neurodivergent people. Those poor, those poor normal people who don't have the same medically diagnosed challenges, those poor people, they must feel horrible. I mean, it, seriously, this is what the, the part of, this is why I don't understand that what, just because someone said it, like we're talking about Greek, we're talking about Greek mythology here. I'm using Greek mythology as a metaphor for a general discussion for people who are autistic, neurodivergent, or, you know, have partners, friends, family members. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so what's the point of the argument of, oh, but that's not what it is? What do you mean? It's Greek mythology, man. What are you talking about? And if that's not what it is, well, I'm here to tell you it's wrong. <laughs> it's the medical model at work here saying, oh, it's the normal people, the normal non-autistic people. They're the people that suffer being in relationships with autistic. Then get the hell out of the relationship, mate. Like, seriously, it doesn't make any sense. And breathe. Probably one of the most common challenges faced by autistic people in relationships is Cassandra syndrome. Let's, let's say that again. Probably one of the most common challenges faced by autistic people in relationships is Cassandra syndrome. Why? Feelings and needs are dismissed or ignored 
by our partner or friends. So there's no point. You're, you're going you're to build intimacy and trust, are you, on that kind of relationship? Really? No, you're not. You're not. <laughs> but there are steps you can take to overcome these challenges if you want to and foster a de- deeper connection in relationships. Do you really want to, though? Autistic people, you might want to. Neurotypical people, do you really want to? Or do you want to just cling on to the idea that you're the Cassandra in this relationship? That that horrible, medically diagnosed autistic person and their challenges that you can't relate to and refuse to understand, that they're the bad person. They're the one dismissing your thoughts and feelings. (laughs) Bring it on. Let's do strategies. And then I'm off to argue with some people online. I'm not, there's not, there's not going to happen. <sighs> How can we prevent Cassandra syndrome ruining relationships? How can we improve communication? How can we improve our understanding of autistic people? Because that's what I'm here to do. Okay. Communicate openly and honestly. One of the most important things you can do in any relationship, I reckon, is communicate openly and honestly. And this, this is interesting, isn't it? Because actually that's not true. There's this kind of unwritten rule, I believe, in relationships where it's better to leave some things unsaid or white lies are good or being open and honest with your partner isn't the right thing to do. And this is a bizarre rule and it makes no sense to me as an autistic person. Based on the premise, too, that And in general terms, my opinion is neurotypical people, in general terms, associate the truth with being rude, where I, as an autistic person, associate the truth as being kind, as being genuine, as being caring. Neurotypical people, the truth, rude. Autistic people, the truth, kind, good, the right thing to do. No, (laughs) that isn't the case. So if you're merging those two worlds, neurotypical and neurodivergent, then, okay, cool, you might still find the truth a bit brutal or or a bit too much. And that's that's your reaction, that's your feeling, fine. So communicate that openly and honestly. Communicate the idea that your autistic partner has upset you or offended you. Right, so that then we're not going to stop, you know, interacting in a way that's that comes across, you know, open and honest or rude or whatever, because we don't. It's not something in our mind that we can know ahead of time. People go, oh, but if you know when you tell the truth, it's rude. Why do you keep telling the truth? It doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Because we don't know what we're about to say is is rude. If all we ever say is what we in our mind think is right. Well, we ne- how could that's not possible? You can't you can't do that in, in you, can, you you can't do that going forward. It's hi- it's a hindsight thing. It's always an argument people always say. If you have so much insight into this, why do you keep doing it? Because I have an autistic brain. Do you, believe it or not, I don't actually I don't actually um, filter everything I say through a neurotypical brain before I say it because I don't have a neurotypical brain. So this is really important, especially important in neurodiverse relationships because again autistic people can have difficulty expressing our feelings or understanding your feelings so what am i saying i'm saying just say what you're feeling just say what you want just say what you need just say what you think does it have to be so groundbreaking can you imagine if in a relationship You just said what you meant, what you want, what you think, what you feel, what you need. Because that's not the case. That doesn't happen. This is a a goldmine. And and again, I know for neurotypical people that can find this hard. But that's, that's actually, let me just say, that's not my problem. I don't care. I don't care if you, my life is hard, right? Just trying to, I don't know, get any kind of peace and acceptance, and it's it's not going to happen, and that's cool, whatever. So I don't care if it's hard, because I'm trying to help you. 
So, so cut away all this peripheral crap you talk and just get to the stuff you need. Man, it doesn't make any sense. By the way, you know, people go, oh, we, we sugarcoat it, right? And that, so the sugar, the people say, oh, we sugar, just sugarcoat it. So you know what sugar does? It rots. Sugar will rot your relationship. You want to sugarcoat stuff to the point where no one can understand it, your relationship's going to get rotten, right? Sugar rots. You want to sugarcoat stuff, you're saying, I want to rot my relationship. Put that on a T-shirt, champ. Another example of how we can improve relationships, we can prevent Cassandra syndrome in neurodiverse relationships, is patience and understanding. So autistic people process information differently and processing times can vary. This sounds like on a, should be on a box. Processing times vary. So the, what I'm trying to say is we may need extra time. In fact, we will. We'll need extra time to not only process what you're saying to us, but respond so in other, in other words, you know, like my wife has evolved to the point where if she'll ask me a question or say something to me, most neurotypical people after a certain period of time will jump in with, are you ignoring me? Did you hear what I said? What's wrong with you? Like what? Or, or they'll just repeat it over and over, which makes it even harder. It sends the autistic brain into a spin where it can't, the processing is getting so fast, like a computer, it just, it just over... Overspeeds it, bang, out she, out she blows, she it shuts down. So the extra time is really important. So you can, you can actually use that understanding that of processing time, of extra time, of how we process things differently. You can understand that. Go, my, my neurodivergent partner is going to hear this differently to how I'm probably saying it, so I'll keep it as open and honest and as, as straightforward as possible. I'll keep it in as black and white and as concrete as possible. But then they're still going to probably process it differently and take longer to process it. But if I, I'll just wait. So I'll do it the best I can, open, honest, in an understanding way, and then I'll just wait. That's it. If you're patient and understanding when you're communicating with your partner or, your, or even your friend, you're, you're going to have much better results in, and this isn't about just one person, it's a win-win. So you're both going to feel more connected right, more at peace, more trusting. It's, that just makes sense. So build extra time into your communication. This is layer on layer. So you want to, you want to convey something to your neurodivergent partner? Be open, be honest. Say what you want, need, feel, think. So we're talking straightforward, open, honest, concrete, explicit, whatever. And build extra time into your communication, into the idea of there should be a response now. They're not even looking at me. Did they hear me? Are they acknowledging me? I give them time. Then you can chime in and go, hey, Ryan, did you hear what I said? No, absolutely not. I'm watching a show on Netflix. What are you talking about? <laughs> Two great things to do. This is a big one, though. This comes down back to that medical model, social model conversation. If you learn more about your partner in both ways, it's going to help. Okay, so as a neurotypical partner or friend of an autistic neurodivergent person, learn more about autism or learn more about them, whatever the neurodivergence is, right? ADHD, whatever it is. Because the more you understand about them, the more you understand about autism, the better equipped you're going to be to understand the challenges they have and to communicate with them. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So I know it can sound a bit like I'm trying to teach you to suck eggs here or something. I mean, this, this shouldn't be offensive when I say learn more about them. So I'm not, this isn't offensive. It should be um, so you feel like your autistic partner dismisses or ignores your thoughts and feelings so you feel like you're experiencing Cassandra syndrome. Okay, so how did you get there? Right, because in your mind you said everything clearly, but they're not getting it. Okay, but so if we take a step back and go, okay, well, do you know, do you, you, do you know your partner is neurodivergent or autistic? Well, chances are yes, hello. 
Okay, because you're watching this video or this podcast, right? Okay. What do you know about that? Not much. Uh, how does it manifest in them? I don't know. What would you say their main challenges are in communicating on an intimate or emotional level? I don't know. What, what do you want me to do then? No. Don't say, I don't know. Say, I know. Get to know, understand the challenges. And th- these things are so simple. If you don't want to have open, honest, kind of straightforward, easy to understand, black and white, just say it how it is, conversations and build in time and be patient and understanding, you don't want to be in a neurodiverse relationship. Uh, that's, just, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. And I do not ever, ever try to say there's one size fits all. I do not believe in the premise that neurodivergent people should only be in relationships with other neurodivergent people, nor do I believe in the premise that neurotypical should be only in neurotypical relationships. I do not believe in that premise because that is not how, it, that is not how relationships work. This is a connection you can't explain, right? So that's just not true. But if you are going to enter into a neurodiverse relationship and you think that there's no work involved on, for both parties, there's no... There's no extra things that have to be done and you just want to blame it on each other, then that is not the relationship for you. You don't, you don't, you know, move into a property with a big backyard if you don't like mowing the lawn. That doesn't make any sense. Don't like mowing the lawn or gardening? Find a flat or an apartment, mate. Like, seriously, you don't like gardening and you don't like mowing the lawn Yet you purposely and specifically moved into this place with a massive backyard. What are you, an idiot? What, what are you talking about? This, this is no different. So by recognising Cassandra syndrome, by working towards creating an environment where feelings and needs are heard and respected by both parties, by getting to the bottom of how both parties work, you can prevent the negative impact of this phenomenon. Cassandra syndrome on your relationship with autistic people, on your relationship with neurotypical people. My friend autism with Orion Kelly. Catch up on all the episodes at orionkelly.com.au. I really do appreciate you sticking through one of the rantiest podcasts I've ever done. But you know what? Sometimes you just gotta you just gotta rant. And I apologise in advance. In, I don't apologise in a genuine, sincere way, though. <laughs> I, like, totally, I Google it. And, like, totes, uh, yeah, you're, like, totally wrong. Anyway, I appreciate your time, my friends. We're here. We're here to hopefully help the world understand autistic people a little bit more. And I've done my bit to ruin the chance of that today. So thank you so much for uh, watching my video podcast or listening to my podcast. Your support means everything to me. To my next podcast, thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll talk soon. You've been listening to My Friend Autism with Orion Kelly. To join the conversation, get in touch with Orion and binge all the podcasts, blogs and videos, visit orionkelly.com.au.